My name is Devin Pluler, and welcome, briefly, to a rainy Toronto. I suspect there's a good chance you're experiencing the same weather in London. Lucky you. Nevertheless, I sincerely wish I was there with you. It's been far too long since I caught up with most of you. If you want to skip this talk to go chat with someone you have only recognized from Twitter, I, I don't blame you. Uh, those are more, the most important parts of conferences like these. But I do want to thank the team of StatsBomb for trusting me to speak at this conference, particularly in this remote fashion, and accepting my admittedly pretty sarcastic research abstract. The tempo is a topic that I'm passionate about, and I hope that comes through during this session. So a quick background, I am the Director of Analytics for Toronto FC. We play in Major League Soccer, and I've been with the club since 2015. I'm a five foot nine goalkeeper turned data scientist and have been working in soccer analytics for about 10 years. My background is more on the software engineering side than the statistics side, and that might become clear over the course of the session. But before Toronto, I worked for Opta out of their New York City office. During that time, they, they shared the office with Major League Soccer, specifically MLS Digital, or I also did some freelance analytics writing for the league websites. My work here in Toronto spans across a, a couple different areas. The thing we mostly use uh, StatsBomb data for is player recruitment. So I'm here to talk to you about tempo. I hate tempo. It's a term that's used as a bit of a catch-all descriptor that commentators and analysts alike use to describe something they can't quite find a better word for. It's a crutch. We regularly hear some variation of it like, this match has a great tempo, or the tempo of this match has really increased. And we just sort of nod our heads in agreement, uh, particularly us nerds dealing with some sort of imposter syndrome while sitting in the coach's office after a game. For me, tempo remains one of those soccer terms that analytics has failed to adequately define. And to start, Let's poke around a couple alternative definitions of tempo in other settings to see where we might have gone astray. Basketball has done us no favors. Much of the confusion that we're facing in soccer stems directly from basketball, where tempo actually has a pretty robust definition. While both soccer and basketball, they you know, when you say tempo, it does, you know, the expression does evoke a need for speed but they come in wildly different varieties. In basketball, an up-tempo team is one that shoots the ball before their allotted shot clock expires, and in turn, increasing the number of total possessions in a game. Adjusting for the difference in tempo, which you can read as difference in opportunity, is quite an important in analytics. It's a cornerstone, right? And this recognition ushered in tempo-free tempo statistics. And if you haven't read Dean Oliver's seminal book on the topic, you probably should. Now, classifying the Phoenix Suns during the Mike D'Antoni era is a, as a high-tempo team would bother nobody. But attaching that same accolade to Stoke City under Tony Poulos would raise quite a few eyebrows, despite both teams sitting at the top of the possessions per game and raw ball speed rankings. When it comes to soccer tempo, I think it's clear that the method of ball movement is just as important as how quickly it moves. When a soccer commentator acknowledges a good tempo, they evoke imagery more belonging to a sunny Barcelona than a cold rainy night in Toronto. This has a lot to do with the difference in nature of possession between the two sports. Possession in soccer is considerably more precarious, and that precariousness is codified directly into the laws of the game. There's some irony that soccer possession is only legally absolute when the ball is out of play, waiting for restart. Another game that employs the term tempo is chess, which happens to be my pandemic hobby. And chess tempo has nothing to do with the funny little clocks you probably all saw in the Queen's Gambit on Netflix. Instead, in a chess match, a tempo is gained when a player accomplishes an objective with fewer moves than what would typically be expected. Conversely, a, a tempo is lost when a player takes an extra move to what is necessary. As an example, take the white rook on the screen. 
in which it takes two moves to travel from H1 to H8, while they could have made that entire leap in just one move. When you make a sequence of moves like this, you usually lose a tempo, and as you can probably intuit, protecting a tempo is critical in chess. The white pieces, which move first, typically win more frequently than they lose. At the highest level, black is eternally chasing white to gain equal footing. While chess is turn-based, I actually think this definition aligns more closely with soccer. To gain an advantage, you must accomplish a little bit more than what is expected with an individual action. And after an advantage is gained, the primary method of retaining it is by moving the ball so rapidly that your opponent has a difficult time catching up. In a game with good tempo, you might imagine the attacking team beating the press on one side of the field and quickly escaping to the opposite flank where they might find a numerical or a time advantage to exploit. The ancillary objective of this research, uh, before attempting to tackle tempo, is to develop an intermediary metric named expected ball speed, or expected BS, as I've come to call it. Uh, so, for example, in the illustration on screen, we would produce an estimated ball speed for the depicted pass. This one, for example, might be 12.5 meters per second, where in reality we do have the actual measurement. Maybe it was 11. This pitch also does a, a good job explaining what the Stats 360 data set gives us, uh, the coordinates of all screen players, uh, all on-screen players, and the ball. I've also added a slight shadow to the area that is on screen in, in view for the broadcast. Actually, I, I think you can probably use this on-screen, off-screen, pixel-wise segmentation as an additional input channel to the neural network architecture I'm gonna present later, but I'll skip that for now. But why do we need this model? Well, directly measuring ball speed doesn't capture what we're looking for. We've established that Stoke of Peter Crouch Vintage doesn't quite fit what, we're, what we consider good or high or enjoyable tempo. And I feel sorry for the analysts of Stoke. It seems like they'll always be associated with this particular style, and it must be remarkably annoying, even if they have since departed from it. Anyway, I, I think that the reasons why we need uh, some sort of expectation model here are pretty obvious. The distribution that you know a center back samples from samples they're passing from from is much different than the range of passing typically available to other positions, and we have to adjust for that. And it almost goes without saying, and it's part and parcel for all of the other foundational expectation models in soccer analytics, not all passes are made equally. So the, the technical inspiration of this research primarily comes from these two papers the pitch control paper by Spearman and his friends at Huddle, and the soccer map paper from Fernandez and Born. I'm gonna show you two contrasting approaches that I've made at estimating ball speed. The first is the parameterization of pass speed in a classical Spearman pitch control surface. Typically, when pitch control is calculated, ball speed is fixed to a particular rate. In this data, I found the average pass speed was around 14 meters per second. Now, luckily I'm pre-recording this presentation so nobody can correct me if I'm, my assumptions are a bit off around what's kind of classically done here. But I do think that leaning on the physics sandbox that Will has gifted our analytics community, we can determine the minimal ball speed required for a particular pass to reasonably be expected to succeed. So for those unfamiliar with pitch control, here is a sample surface produced from the data made available to us in the research competition. And it's probably worth mentioning now how some of my graphics work. Blue is the attacking team in, in all of the pictures, and they are playing from left to right or down to up on some of the vertical pitches built in NPL Soccer, which is a awesome open source plotting tool for those who don't know it. In short, you know, pitch control, we, we calculate the a minimal time to intercept for each team and the ball uh, for every discretized cell of the field here and for the rest of this talk I'm using one cell for every square meter and depending on by how much a particular team can beat their opponent to 
each individual cell, that cell is assigned some gradient of ownership between the two teams. If you want some more specific de details, go and read Will's paper. And it's also worth noting that my pitch control surfaces use a series of approximations for the purpose of reducing computation speed. They can be quite slow if you want finely grained measures, and that particularly becomes bad when you're calculating across you know, tens of thousands of passes. You might be wondering about velocities, if you're familiar with pitch control. One of the best things about pitch control is that it properly accounts for player velocities. That Stats 1360 data doesn't include velocities. So for this work, I've assumed that every player has a starting velocity of zero, at least at the time of each pass. Now, obviously, this isn't a great assumption, but the surfaces it produces are, are mostly good enough for a toy example such as this. However, there are a couple approaches for potentially incorporating velocity. Uh, and, and the first would be to produce a velocity vector for each player that points directly at the ball and assume, assigns a fixed magnitude, say, two meters per second. This provided, when I tried it, some, some extra sensibility to the surfaces around the origin of the pass. But what wasn't particularly intuitive for other areas farther from the ball. Now you can perhaps add a few different or additional heuristics here to create something more generalizable. Let me know if you have any success. Another approach, and this is one I haven't had time to try, is to investigate the, the freeze frame of the reception event related to the pass and directly measure how players have moved between frames. Now, the freeze frames don't have player identities, so this isn't like a trivial problem, but you can reasonably estimate which dots belong to which players between the two frames using some sort of minimum spanning algorithm, though I do think that those can be sort of expensive as well. And yet another approach, uh, one that is perhaps only available to internal club analysts, would be to match these freeze frames to the true full tracking frames and build a model that estimates each player's velocity given the surrounding tactical context available. But that's way out of the scope of this research, but it does sound like a fun project. Anyway. We iterate across a, a range of ball speeds, uh, such as these time to intercept surfaces on screen and calculate pitch control accordingly. And uh, here is an example of a, a singular situation, but with three different implied ball speeds, 10, 14, and 18 meters per second. You can think of it as slow, average, and fast. You can see when the ball moves slowly on the left, more of the field is, is naturally under control of the defending team. As the, as the speed increases from left to middle to right, you can see an increasing amount of blue and a potential passing lane emerging as the tide of defensive pressure recedes. Now, here's the same example. I, I flipped it horizontally for convenience. In, instead of calculating pitch control at every cell and building a surface, we instead calculate the PCF at a bunch of points between the origin and the destination of the pass along its trajectory. The, the plot on the right represents the PCF along the ball path, assuming different ball speeds. Uh, and as you can see, uh, with this particular pass, the PCF only stays above 50% for the duration of the pass when the ball speed is 18 meters per second or faster. Everything else, it looks likely that it'll be intercepted. And you can kind of tell, given the shape of the curve, where along that trajectory it might be intercepted. We can repeat the same sort of minimum ball speed exercise for every pass in our data set and, and determine which players and teams might regularly pass the ball you know, much faster than, than what's required. There are some strengths to this approach. Uh, firstly, it's, it's physics-based and we're leaning on real-world kinematics, and, and those have been pretty well understood for hundreds of years, at least at speeds much lower than the, the speed of light. And it easily incorporates player velocity, and you know, that's really just you know a when, not if, we, we obtain it. But there are some negatives, and, and I think that they pretty heavily outweigh the strengths of this approach. Producing services are slow, though, though you do save a, a lot of computation time when you're only evaluating along the passive trajectory, it, kind of becomes prohibitive sometimes. Additionally, I'm not quite as smart as others that have properly handled the Z dimension in this kind of problem. I, I, I know that there are there is some work out there that has taken a stab at it, including Spearman, but I found it pretty difficult to implement. But I think most importantly, this approach doesn't do well with missing data. 
while a beam physics based is an explicit strength, we are dealing with heavily incomplete information in situations where the broadcast field of view is particularly narrow. Until we have an inference model that guesses where the remaining off-screen players might be, this approach probably isn't viable. As a bit of a caveat, I, I do think that it might be the stronger angle of attack when you do have a, a full set of tracking data. My second approach, and I think ultimately the more fruitful one, is a reconfiguration of Soccer Map. If you're familiar with Javier's work, his deep neural network takes a series of spatial features and produces some sort of supremely interpretable surface. Primarily, it's, it's used to build the surfaces that represent passing difficulty, which is you know, pretty, pretty identical to the motivations around kind of the Spearman pitch control. However, since the architecture of Soccer Map is so flexible, you know, the target variables and the activations of the final surface layer can be manipulated to answer different questions. And that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, so what I've done is, is change the sigmoid required to classify a pass as successful or unsuccessful into a linear activation that can handle outputs outside the, the normal kind of zero to one range you would get with a sigmoid. And, and instead of predicting the success of a pass, I'm predicting the speed of a pass. So the architecture of my version looks like this. It borrows really heavily from Soccer Map, and in particular, it utilizes the, the brilliant one-by-one -one pixel layer prediction that allows the model to construct an entire prediction surface but evaluate loss at just a single point where you actually have an output. But there are a couple of key differences. We have different spatial input channels, uh, and I'll show you them on the, the next slide. Uh, we don't have skip connections. Uh, I didn't find that they added a whole lot of specificity to the, the eventual prediction surfaces. Our model is also a bit more shallow. We, we pool down to just one half of the original input dimension, where the full soccer map model goes down to one quarter dimension. And because we have fewer input channels, no skip connections, and a shallower network, uh, we naturally have many fewer trainable parameters. Uh, we have about 1,200, where I believe Soccer Map has around 400,000. Now, smaller is not necessarily better. I'm definitely not bragging here. And, and this is especially true when you have a well-tuned model like the one over in Barcelona. But I found that the scale of this was much more manageable. And while I did train the model on a cloud GPU, I was wasn't super interested in breaking the bank in terms of computing cost. We have four input channels. Um, they look like this. The first two are, are surfaces that represent the minimum distance between each cell in the surface and a player belonging to either the attacking team and the defending team. The third surface is, is the same, uh, but represents the distance between each cell and the ball. The fourth slide is a little bit different. It, it represents the raw difference between the attacking and the defending team surfaces. So literally just taking the first one and subtracting the second one from it. Uh, and this can sort of be interpreted as a very crude pitch control surface in a sense. It, it's kind of a, probably more specifically, sort of a continuous Voronoi. In the soccer map paper, these sort of spatial characteristics are, are represented in a much more sparse fashion. I've tried that, but I've always found that continuous services like these, in, in a couple different use cases that I've had, tend to produce more reliable results, but your mileage may vary. The training details are, are pretty straightforward. Loss is calculated as the absolute difference between the actual and predicted ball speed. There's the specific number of trainable parameters. I, I use an atom optimizer just like any other, you know, not that experienced deep learning students. I didn't train the model on the full data set available to us, mostly for the sake of time, uh, but I do suspect that you'll easily have enough passing variety across 50 games uh, to produce a model that generalizes well. So here are some of the prediction surfaces. Now, these are chosen randomly and, and only filtered really for variety. I didn't hyper curate these to only show you the ones that looked good. They all look pretty similar to this. And these examples are also out of sample. Uh, the model has never seen any of these particular underlying data before. Uh, and it seems like I forgot a legend, but, it, but I think the color scales are pretty intuitive. It's normalized such that, the, such that white is the average at around 14 meters per second. It goes from you know eight on the low end to 20 on the high end from blue to red. 
and they look quite good. There are a lot of strengths to this approach. Most importantly, where pitch control fails. This approach manages to capture some of the out of view context. For example, the model seems to sort of understand that the defending team probably has a goalkeeper lurking somewhere behind the back line. And while the pitch control approach produced fairly interpretable results, this approach makes them considerably more sensical. And since we don't have to calculate or approximate time to intercept surfaces, and the model is relatively small, it's quite fast at inferencing. The only slow part really is the production of the input channels, but they're pretty easily produced with NumPy broadcasting. However, and this is a bit of a tragedy, the model doesn't perform a whole lot better than naive models. Building a simple polynomial regression using just pass distance as a sole feature to predict ball speed does almost as good. Now, I, I think there may be some bugs on, on my ends, okay. and, and that may have led to some of the underscoring of the model accuracy. But I do think with some hyperparameter tuning and, and perhaps some adjustments to the structure of the overall architecture, we can reach something that's a bit more performant. But I'm actually not that worried about explicit performance, at least measured in this fashion. In a sense, uh, this modeling technique is less about making a single prediction to evaluate against. You know, why bother with all these surfaces? But, but instead, the, the production of an entire surface, which lends itself to validation from some other industry expert. Model benchmarking aside, let's get back to tempo and uh, wrap things up. Someone helped me with this math slide, and they asked to remain anonymous while providing the warning of, don't blame me for any Ian Graham critiques. I, I genuinely have no idea if I got this right. But all I'm trying to propose is that tempo should be defined as the average difference between the actual and expected ball speeds over some set of passes. In other words, you know, a player that regularly completes their passes at a faster speed than expected when adjusting for the tactical context in which they attempted those passes in is one that plays at a high tempo. Uh, accumulating these deltas over various cadences will allow the, a type of analysis that was previously out of reach, not limiting to you know, which players played a high tempo, but also like identifying pass types that certain teams may struggle to complete at a high tempo. There's, there's all kinds of different ways that you can chop and change here, and the possibilities I, I think are wide open. And I would typically follow this very mathy slide with one that ranks all the players in the data set by their relative tempo score or, or whatever. I haven't done that as I generally feel uncomfortable as someone who works a lot in recruitment talking about specific players. I don't want anything to be misinterpreted, but, but also the model isn't perfect. So I'll leave that bit up to your collective imaginations, but I can tell you that the list looks just about what you'd expect with the inevitable couple outliers that really make you question the validity of the model. Anyway, catch me on Twitter and GitHub. I'm planning on open sourcing the code used to produce this research. I'll let you know when I do. Thanks a lot.